All right, I'm probably gonna get started just a little bit early uh, because I don't wanna run long for you all. Um, and I will talk really fast because I know we've all gotten used to watching our videos at 1.5x and our podcasts at 1.5x during the pandemic. So we're just gonna hit the ground running. Um, you can find me after if you have any questions, but welcome. My name is Mercedes Bernard, and today we're gonna be talking about how to get comfy in a new code base. So kick back, relax, and make yourself at home. I work at Cloud City as a principal software engineer, and we're hiring. So if anything I say sounds interesting today, reach out, connect, Twitter, you know, come find me. And if you are someone who likes to follow along with slides, I've published them on my website. Uh, they are very low res since the Wi-Fi is bad, so hopefully it'll work if you need it. Four years ago, Sarah May gave a keynote at RailsConf about livable code. And if you haven't uh, checked it out, I really encourage you to go watch it. She talked about how writing applications is no longer like construction or architecture. We're not focused on making buildings anymore. Now we're focused on making those buildings livable for ourselves and our teams. We organize the space and the code so that we can do the things we want to do comfortably. And I really liked this metaphor about thinking about a code base like a house that you decorate and make your own. I've been a consultant for the last 10 years, and this means that I don't really get to claim any code base as home. I work in up to 20 repos a year, and just last year I pushed production code in 18 repos. So because I don't get to claim any code base as my home base, it means that I have to find ways to make myself feel at home in a place that isn't really mine. And it's like I'm a reverse digital nomad where I'm always working out of my home office but in a completely different code base every time. So it's like the Airbnb of coding. And I don't know about you, but as much as I want to be a world traveler, living out of a suitcase stresses me out. Even though jumping into a new code base is something I do really regularly, it always gives me a little bit of anxiety. What if this is the first one that stumps me? What if I can't find my way around? What if this house doesn't have a blow dryer or towels? This anxiety is super, super normal. And just like any seasoned traveler will tell you, it gets easier the more you do it. You figure out how to quickly assess a space and see that it has what you need. You learn what bits are most important and which ones actually aren't, or at least not right away. So on your first morning of your visit, you'll need to find the towels and figure out how to work the shower, but you don't need to worry about learning the fancy sound system or going through the closets to find all the cleaning supplies just yet. So if I'm gonna be showing you how to get comfy in a brand new space, it should be a brand new space for me too. So for this talk, I decided to make a contribution to an open source repo that I've never looked at, but we all use all the time, rubygems.org. So shout out to Ruby Central, who maintains Ruby Gems and who's also putting on this wonderful conference for us. So before you can contribute to a new code base, you have to get a high level understanding of what's there and where things are. So when you're staying in an Airbnb, the first thing you do is walk through the house, right? Or if you're visiting a friend for the first time, they might give you a tour, or at the very, very least, they'll show you where you're sleeping and where the bathroom is. So documentation is the place that you start your tour. I know not every code base has the best documentation, but there's almost always something to get you started. Look at the readme and follow the links that you find there. Look for contributing guides, listed dependencies, links to staging and production versions of the app, design diagrams, anything and everything that you can find. Rubygem rubygems.org's readme is pretty slim, uh, actually, but I learned a lot of information from it. And the main part, helpful parts were under the contributions header that they had. In that, they linked a bunch of different documents, including their contribution guidelines. And in those guidelines, there's this really helpful entity relationship diagram. So when I find diagrams in documentation, I get Super excited, it's like the host left out a tray of cookies to greet me. Uh, and diagrams are a really simple way to show a lot of info all at once. So ERDs like this one show you model relationships. Sequence diagrams can show you data flow. And a simple flow chart, like you might have seen if you were in the TDD talk, can show you expected app behavior. 
In this diagram, I can see that the database is pretty simple. This is almost the whole thing, except I cut off a little bit on the edge. Um, there aren't too many models for me to keep straight, and I can start to get a sense of what I'm gonna find in the code. For example, here, uh, right, well, you can't see my thing. Well, right there in the middle, you can see that users and webhooks are related, so someone can probably set up events for themselves to uh, subscribe to be notified when something happens. Other places that I like to look for useful information when I'm jumping into new code is Slack threads and project management tickets. So both of those could turn into giant black holes of information because you could just like keep scrolling and scrolling. So it's important to time box yourself. Um, I typically only look back a sprint or two to figure out what the team's been focusing their time and energy on and like how that fits in with the repo. Uh, any longer than a sprint or two and you risk wasting valuable time on information that's already outdated. Rubygem rubygems.org's <laughs> contribution guidelines provided everything that I needed to know about how to get the project set up. So after I read the readme and all the linked documents I can find, that's where I usually go next. I learn a ton about a project by trying to get all the individual pieces working. So I think of this a little bit like walking through the house and finding the things you're gonna need every single day. Silverware, check. Remotes, check. Correct Ruby version, yes. Database, got it. So as you're setting up the repo, pay attention to different services that you're gonna need. What database is the code using? Do they have a cache layer? What is it? What web server? Uh, are there any other services that this repo is dependent on? How is the app deployed? All of this information is helpful for you as you form a mental model of this code base and then how it fits into the wider system. So if the project is containerized, looking at the container config is a really good place to start to find this info. But if it's not, the act of setting the project up will probably require you to set up each of these dependencies separately, so you'll be aware of them by the time you get the whole app running. During project setup, you'll also find how dev-friendly the code base is. How much help do you need from other team members just to get the app running? Can you do it by yourself in under an hour? If it takes three days and three different people to help you get unstuck, you should probably start to prepare for the mess that's waiting for you behind this door. After getting the project set up, I find it hard to absorb much more about the code in the abstract. So I think about it like if somebody's trying to describe a floor plan to you, it can be really hard to picture. I once had this teeny tiny studio apartment where you walk in, there's this hallway, and there's a bathroom on one side and a closet on the other. Then there's the main living space right ahead, and then it wraps around, and there's a kitchen in the corner with space for a dining room table. And so no matter how simple I tried to explain that, I bet half of you pictured it wrong. <laughs> so trying to learn about a code base by only reading it and its docs is kind of like that. So once I have the project running, I actually pick up a ticket or an issue and start working on understanding it and the changes that it requires. And this is the main takeaway of the talk. I'm not hiding it or burying it. So you don't need to learn the whole code base to make a valuable contribution. By tackling bite-sized issues just ticket by ticket, you'll learn more and faster than if you feel pressured to understand the whole system before you get started. So learning this way takes advantage of both scaffolding and spaced learning. Scaffolding is breaking up learning into chunks and providing a tool or structure with each chunk. So in this case, a specific bug to resolve or small feature to implement. And spaced learning refers to practicing at regular intervals, which is more effective than practicing all at once. And there are multiple psychological theories that back up the efficacy of learning this way. So in true scaffolding fashion, I just looked for a good first issue. And in this case, there was only one. So my choice was very easy. So that's what we're gonna be working on. This issue uh, reported a bug where sometimes when you tried to add an owner to a gem, it would silently fail and the owner wouldn't be added. So to start working on a ticket, we get to use one of my favorite strategies for learning more about the relevant code, which is digging into version control. It's a little bit of code archaeology. 
So the version control history, the commit messages, and then past pull requests tell you a lot about what's been tried before, what's worked, what hasn't, why changes were made, and then who made them. This is all valuable information when you're trying to work with code that you've never seen before, and it can save you a lot of time from trying the wrong solution. So it can help you understand why part of the code is confusing and doesn't make any sense. And then it can point you towards who to ask questions if you get stuck. In this case, uh, someone had actually opened a PR for this exact issue two years ago, but they'd closed it without merging it. Their solution had been to change the dot creates to create bang so that if saving failed, it would raise an error. In the conversation in the PR, one of the members suggested a slight change to uh, check the return value of the save and display errors. But overall, the solution, and more helpfully for me, the location of the solution was right. Um, but the PR was closed due to lack of activity. Now I know this could be part of what I need to get this issue closed for good. So before I start making changes, I like to make sure I understand what the code is doing. Not all the code, uh, just the bits that I'm concerned with for the ticket that I'm working on. I would love to know how the whole code base works, but there's like no way I can hold all of that context in my head, especially at the beginning. So I'm starting small and I'm intentionally scaffolding and spacing my learning. I trace the functionality I'm working with through the call stack to see what methods get invoked and what they do. This seems really simple, but I'm sure, as a lot of you know, reading somebody else's code can be extremely challenging. So to get started, you need to find your entry point into the control flow. I tend to like to work from the front end down to the database, finding where a user interacts with a feature and then following the code that direction. But in some cases, starting at the database and learning about the models and the associations and then climbing your way to the front end might be a little bit better. So let's start by looking at our model layer. This is the ownership model, and the important bits right now are the associations and the validations. We can ignore any custom class or instance methods until we encounter them while we're tracing the code. It looks like here that we have a few associations and we have this one interesting validation that says we can only have a single ownership per RubyGem user combo. I wasn't familiar with how ownerships get added, so to start tracing the code, my entry point was finding all the instances where, we're, where we were creating new ownerships, because uh, I want to make sure that none of them silently fail anymore. And you'll see I'm not using any fancy IDE extensions. I'm not doing anything like, ooh, look at this, I'm so cool. I'm just using a vanilla code search. Um, so to find where this is happening, I leaned on my active record knowledge. Tapping into prior knowledge is actually a scaffolding technique that if anybody here has been a teacher in a prior life, you probably know about. Um, but it helps with retaining information by building connections of what you're learning to what you already know. So first, uh, I tried to find where we're initializing new ownerships, and apparently, nowhere. So then I was like, okay, well, what about not initializing, but we're creating? And this was really interesting, because I can see that there's a custom class method on the ownership model that's invoked in two places. So I'm going to write those down to go look at them uh, when I start investigating what these do. In that method, it looks like it's creating ownerships from the RubyGem association, which is also interesting, because that's not what I searched for originally. So I wonder if anywhere else in the code base follows that pattern. But no, it looks like ownerships.create is only in that one ownership class method. But if I go back to thinking about like, well, what if I use that pattern and look for initialize, I can see that we have ownerships.new used in a couple different controllers. So I'm going to note those two places down as well. So right now, I have four places to look at uh, ownerships being created and saved to the database. Notice that I still don't know a ton about these four use cases. Neither do you. Um, I couldn't tell you when they get called or from where, and that's totally OK. I'm going to keep my focus on the small task that I'm trying to complete and not worry about understanding all of it. 
So let's take a look at the controllers first. This is where we have the ownerships.new. And this is where the changes in that closed PR that we looked at earlier were located. This code must have been updated since the issue was reported because in both of these controllers, the value of save is checked, just like the suggestion uh, had said. So if the ownership is invalid and it's not saved, then an error is reported to the user. So neither of the controllers seem to still be problems, which means we've narrowed down the possible remaining culprits to be just the places where that custom class method ownership.create confirmed is called. So my absolute number one favorite way to explore and understand new code is interactive debugging. I learn more from this than even what the version control history tells me. I'm not a debugging purist, so I love print debugging. I use my put statements whenever you know, the mood strikes. But I find that the control, that two-way communication, um, and that interactive debugging provides me, helps me learn a lot and very quickly. So you can think of interactive debugging like opening all the drawers and closets to take an inventory of what you have available to you. So in this case, I wanted to know what this create confirmed class method was doing. And I wanted to know how it handled non-valid, non-persisted models. So I threw a couple of prize statements in the method. Uh, I set the return value of confirm bang to a variable so I could inspect it. And then I cracked open the Rails console. So here you'll see uh, the first thing I did, I just wanted to show you there are no existing ownerships in my database. And then I just initialized some variables that I'm gonna need to pass as parameters to the create confirmed method. So, so far this doesn't do anything that interesting. But once I run create confirmed, the code's gonna pause execution at my first breakpoint. And here you'll see that uh, the breakpoint is after the create method and we've created an ownership. When I look at the value of it, it I mean, it looks good to me. There's an ID, so I know it's persisted, and then I can see all of its object properties. But now I wanna step into that confirm bang method and see what's happening. We can see that in that method, it just calls the vanilla update if the model hasn't been confirmed yet, and then it returns the value of the update. But I'm really glad that I stepped into this method because I would assume that confirm bang ran update bang and raised an error if the model was invalid, but it doesn't. So instead, there's no error raised, it'll just return false. So then when I go to the next line, you see that I come back up into the create confirmed method. And I can check the value of success, which is true, and that's what would be returned in a successful use case. And you can see that we have uh, one ownership in the database after I run through this debugging uh, scenario. But now I wanna look at the behavior of an unsuccessful case. So I'm gonna do the exact same thing, and I'm gonna to try to create a duplicate confirmed ownership for the same uh, user and Ruby gem, because remember we have that validation that this shouldn't be allowed. So when we look at the value of the created ownership, you'll see that it doesn't have an ID. So it wasn't persisted to the database. And because I already know what the confirm method does, I'm just gonna next over it and verify that this method would return false like I expect, which it would, success is false. I'm also gonna verify that my assumption that the ownership is invalid is actually the case, which it is. Uh, and I can take a look at the errors which match what we'd expect. You can see user has already been taken, so it's violating that uniqueness constraint that we saw earlier. So because this create confirmed method re just returns the value from confirm bang, when an ownership can't be created, it's going to return false. So where are we using this create confirmed method? We're using it in the ownership request model when we are approving an ownership request. And we're using it in another small method in the Ruby gem model. Uh, this tiny method is only called from one location in the code and we're gonna look at that in a minute. But all of the code that we just looked at and debugged is really straightforward. It's not doing anything complex, but it did take us a minute to get through the couple layers of methods. 
And we found that interesting convention violation where the confirm bang method called the regular update and not update bang as most uh, Rails devs would expect. So no matter how senior we get, whenever we move into a new code base, we always have to start tracing the code somewhere and checking our assumptions. Tracing the code you need one bug or feature at a time is a great way to learn the whole code base. Over time, you'll get an awareness of all the important pieces of the code and the pieces that change frequently. In this way, you're learning as needed and you won't waste any of your time on parts that don't matter or that very rarely change. So at this point, I'm feeling sufficiently welcome in the code base. I hope you are all feeling just as welcome as I do. Um, and I have an understanding about the bits of code that I'm gonna be working on to resolve this first issue. So now I get to settle in and like start to make the place feel a little bit more like my own. At this point, I know where ownerships are getting created. This is our original four locations that we talked about. And we've ruled out silent failures in the two controllers. These are now checking the value of save, doing exactly what that suggestion said, so we're good. And we verified in our debugging that trying to update and confirm an invalid ownership will return false. So it seems like approving an invalid ownership from the ownership request model will behave the way we expect it to. It looks like there's only one place left where create could silently fail. So let's focus there and try to fix that. When we're making changes to a new code base, just start by mimicking existing examples. So this code comes from the pusher class and we can see that it invokes that, uh, that teeny tiny Ruby gem create ownership method which calls the custom class method we debugged. This code's doing a few other things and it rescues exceptions. So I wanna be careful with my code changes so that if creating an ownership fails, I don't leave open the possibility of saving a broken state. Using an active record transaction feels like a good idea to me, but I also wanna make sure that I'm matching current code base conventions. So I looked in the code and I found a few examples where they open transactions from the relevant AR model. So I feel like I can go ahead and use this strategy for wrapping uh, this create logic. But when I was working on this, I actually couldn't remember how active record transactions handle different error types. Honestly, I never do. Um, which brings me to the next strategy for settling in, which is documentation. Don't be afraid to look up documentation. So look it up for active record classes, uh, any other dependencies, external libraries, browser behavior, database specs, CI, like whatever you could possibly need. Because um, even when you've been coding for decades, we never remember everything and answers are only a Google search away. So for this issue, I looked up how active record transactions handle exceptions. And dun -dun -dun, all exceptions are re-raised except active record rollback exceptions, which I truly, I always forget. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this code in a transaction. I'm gonna keep the rescue block, but then I'm gonna raise a rollback exception if creating an ownership fails. So now this code's gonna roll back any database operations in the event of an exception, but it will still return false as expected. We just added one extra false case so that if an ownership is not created, it'll also return false. I chose to explicitly raise an exception right here um, so that it would be clear to future contributors what my intention was, but I also could have chosen to refactor that create ownership method and do the exception stuff in there. It's really just personal preference. So while you're making a change, if you get any errors while running your code, be sure to slow down and read what your errors are telling you. This seems really obvious, but honestly, it's one of the tips that I give the most frequently when I'm pairing with someone new, regardless of how, like, how many years of experience they have. Um, we have a tendency to wanna go fast and be productive, especially when we're trying to prove that we're competent in unfamiliar code. So we make a lot of assumptions about why our code is broken and we're really quick to assume that we screwed up so that we actually forget to read the error message and just like look at what the computer's telling us. So if you wanna speed up your coding skills, this one small strategy to slow down will actually make you go significantly faster in the long run. 
So I've made my change, I've left my mark on the place, and now I share in the responsibility to make this code base welcoming to future guests. It's my turn to clean up and maybe put out some cookies to make the next guest feel comfy. Commit messages and PR descriptions are gonna help future guests and contributors when they need to do their own code archeology. span So be sure to leave enough info in the history that someone following you six months from now which could be you, uh, understands what you did and why. In a commit message, you don't have to limit yourself to the 50 character summary. You can also include a description with more in-depth info about what you did. So this is particularly helpful if you need more info than what you can describe in just that little message. For instance, if you're squashing a bunch of commits, like really put as much as you can from those commits into the description. Uh, or if you want to include like a rationale for a decision in the description for future contributors. And in your PR descriptions, instead of just describing like what change you made, be sure to include context or why you made the changes. Link to things liberally. So link to docs, link to code samples, GitHub issues, Stack Overflow threads, anything that helped you find the answer. Because you never know when that's gonna be helpful to someone later who's gonna have to go digging through the history. And then write valuable tests that describe expected behavior. Rather than testing that your code didn't raise an error or only testing happy paths, be sure to uh, describe and test edge cases. So when I opened a PR for this change to prevent silent failures, I got a bunch of failing tests <laughs> like this one, which is a controller test to create a new version of an existing Ruby gem. And it might be a little bit hard to see, but the key part of the description is with confirmed ownership should respond with success. The only time creating an ownership is invalid is if one already exists. But this test was added a year and a half ago after that original issue was opened to test that in this case, the code actually does silently fail and still return like success. So if I had looked at these tests before I started coding, I might have caught this. Valuable tests will not only help prevent future guests like me from breaking expected functionality, they also serve as documentation for contributors to refer to. So I ended up closing my PR and letting the maintainers know that the original issue we looked at was outdated and no longer needed. So even though the code that I did for this issue didn't get merged, I'm not bummed. I still helped close the issue and as I got comfy in the code, I actually opened up a couple other PRs with small things I noticed, like strong params and other things that were missing. So finally, good hosts create documentation and keep it up to date. Uh, I hope you're noticing a pattern. Documentation is really, really helpful. I'm trying not to belabor the point. But uh, this includes tests, code comments, readmes, diagrams, everything, it doesn't have to be long form written docs, but make sure that if you see something is out of date, you do your part and you update it. So when I was working on this issue, I noticed that the ERD that we talked about earlier was out of date and it was missing some key models, like that ownership request that we saw. So I opened a PR to update the ERD. The diagram is just an SVG inside the repo and I didn't know how to update it, so? I went digging through Git history, and big shout out to Carrie, who left the perfect commit message so that I would know how to update this, you know, two years later. After opening that PR, a contributor gave me a great suggestion to turn it into a GitHub action and make checking that the ERD is up to date part of CI, since it's so easy for new contributors to miss that step, which, kicked off this talk all over again because then I had to go make a contribution to Rails ERD uh, so that we could have consistent output from that gem in order to have the consistent output for our GitHub action. So whether you're visiting a code base for a short period of time or moving in for a bit longer, you don't need to know it inside and out in order to make valuable contributions. By making small contributions right away, you'll get comfy bit by bit, and you'll end up learning how all of the parts of the system fit together faster than trying to learn it all at once. 
You don't need to know where all the pots and pans are, how the stove works, and then go out and buy groceries on your first day. You can microwave some soup while you look around the kitchen and get your bearings. So like I mentioned earlier, I work for Cloud City, a certified B Corp that works with socially responsible clients. So we're hiring. That sounds interesting. They would love if you would come talk to me, um, reach out to me on Twitter, whatever. But yeah, thank you so much. Thanks for coming.